Retention has been the worst thing to come through our edit suite. Like, <laughs> if you want to know what's next for YouTube, look to Michelle Carey. All the best performing videos on YouTube have those three elements. Michelle has trained with the army, survived the hottest place on earth, and made me interested in the politics of a cheer squad. I don't think you really do understand the quality that you produce. Maybe not. <laughs> Michelle creates spectacle-based YouTube videos, which yes, is the trend, but hers are the best because of her experience in traditional media. And instead of retention, her team focuses on experiential storytelling. Six seconds, yeah. you can tell a full story. Yeah, story is king. Like, if we're not telling a good story, why are we doing it? This storytelling is brought to life by her director, Garrett, and her editor, Silas. Who are better than me at everything else. And now we have this really cool synergy among the three of us. This team is setting the example for other creators. And their secret to good videos is surprisingly obvious. Storytelling. Oh. <laughs> you came from, definitely from the traditional background and you went and looked at YouTube and went, okay, how can I bring some of the traditional language into YouTube? And you kind of created this really fascinating hybrid of that type of content. You have that TV studio quality with the YouTube authenticity, which for me, in my opinion, is actually some of the best content on YouTube. Dang, well thanks, <laughs> holy cow. Someone like clip that, I'm gonna make it an NFT and then buy it for myself, <laughs> oh my gosh. Really it's um, a team effort. I'm so glad this is the first podcast where we get to have Garrett and Silas also be a part of the conversation. So thanks for inviting all of us here because all of, oftentimes I'm on these podcasts and I'm like, it's a team effort and there's so many amazing people and it's Garrett and Silas too. And to hear from them, I think is going to be really valuable to the audience as well, rather than just like translated through me. That is exactly what it is. Like Michelle Carre is, of course, you're the talent, but as the brand, it would be naive to assume we do do everything. I think I feel the traditional director role when we work together. Uh, sometimes creative director role is like my official title. If we come up with an idea, Michelle and I will sort of pitch around multiple stories that can work within that concept. So I'll pitch 10 of them and then Michelle's like, no, this is the one that feels real. This is the one I feel like we can do. And once you feel good about it and I feel good about being able to tell that story, we'll pass it to Silas and Silas will say if he feels like he can make that happen. We are capturing things as they happen, as they really do happen, but we go in shooting with a very specific idea in mind. And we're not cheating or fudging the footage. It's like, here's a couple of different ways this story could be told. Let's make sure some of it starts happening that way when we're on camera. If we're if we're realizing that story's not getting captured, my job as director is either to make it try to happen or we pivot the story entirely. And that's happened before. We've, we've pivoted lots yeah. of times. We've yeah. been doing a shoot. The story just isn't happening the way we thought it was. It was actually becoming disingenuous to tell it that way. And so we pivoted to a story that felt more genuine. We've done that on the day of the shoot sometimes. Yeah. How do you guys collaborate in post to make sure that you have that story? And if you don't, what do you do? I mean, one example is definitely chess. Well, it was a six month Right, approximately. I think it was eight, eight, months, eight, eight months, months of footage. Project. Oh wow! This was an example where we shot an episode. Yeah, it took eight months. Michelle's training for a chess tournament, and then our what we thought was the finale, which is a chess tournament where Michelle is playing chess against Mr. Beast and Pokemon and all these big creators. We thought, oh, that's the epic finale. Ended up being our midpoint reversal. Uh, if if you know if we're dealing with Snyder's beats, save the cat, like yeah. like standard classic story structure. Our finale became her midpoint, which was the high that Michelle thought that she wanted this whole character arc, this whole journey. But when she reached it, she realized, oh, that's not actually what was fulfilling. What was fulfilling to her was her original goal, which was to get an ELO rating 1000 in chess, which is a little milestone that she really wanted. And so, yeah, like what Silas was saying, the new finale, the new climax became her actually hitting that after the tournament and mustering the... Uh, the determination to want to continue playing chess just to hit that personal goal, even though there was no finale tournament on the line anymore. And that's happened a few times where we're in the edit. We're like, this is a fine video. But when we when I personally really tap down deep into my own soul, I'm like, I know I have to get back in there and go further. And so, wow. I mean, that's happened on a few on a few different videos where we extend the project um, which I'm sure drives Silas insane and me and Garrett. Well, that's, um, also, that's also always, I mean, the, the diving back in is always the most compelling part of the actual story. Like in, 
real movies where you have the end of act two and then the character goes back in and goes to victory. So I think, I think in the cases where we have done that, it's, it works that way for a reason. For me, documentary is improv filmmaking or improv narrative. Like we don't get to sit down and write a feature length film and then go out and shoot that exact scene as it was supposed to be shot. Like we are handed these scraps and little bits and now we have to sit down and go, okay, how can we build a story out of the little scraps that were just handed to us? And that to me is a really exciting challenge that I don't know. I don't know. That's why I love it. Where most creators would stop, you guys always just keep going, which is really, really just as a huge testament to the content that you make and the patience that you have while making it as well. Because everybody on YouTube is so fearful of what happens if they don't upload or what happens if they're not consistent. And you guys are like, shoot, this story isn't as good as we can make it. So how can we take it to its fullest potential? Yeah, story is king. Like if we're not telling a good story, why are we doing it? I think a lot of I think Honestly, like the past couple of years on YouTube, it has definitely turned into people making videos just to become a big YouTuber, not because they actually like storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people started off that way and then found their love of storytelling and now we're evolving. There are some amazing stories being told on the platform right now, um, and I'm excited for the new sort of pivot and the new pivot of the direction of the platform, which I think everyone is starting to start to yeah. feel that occurring. How did you guys learn storytelling personally? I mean, I, I came from strictly digital title thumbnail. It gets views, good, replicate it, move on. And what I don't even think I realized then is even some of the most viral vines have a beginning, middle, and end. Wow. And a payoff mm -hmm. and a reversal of expectation. In like six, a six seconds, yeah. you can tell a full story. And literally all the best performing videos on YouTube have those three elements. Um, and getting to work with Garrett, I mean, you can literally see on my channel, please don't go look, the difference between <laughs> when when I started working with all of them um, and the impact in the quality, the, the infrequency of uploads, but the increase of quality that came. And so for me, it's been on set learning from these guys also just like, I find my home is in producing and like my sadistic enjoyment of Excel and other <laughs> Google Drive products. Oh um, and so I, it allowed me this opportunity. Like I, you know, I didn't go to film school. Both of them did. And so I can focus on what I know best is organization and getting things done, writing a compelling email to convince the Secret Service to work with us, and then bringing in professionals who are better than me at everything else and can also help teach me along the way. And now we have this really cool synergy among the three of us where we can kind of almost predict things that are needs for each other and how I can in pre-production help the edit. You actually just said something that I sort of have decided to live by, which is just surround yourself with people who are better than you at everything else. Wow. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like even at the thing that you do, like I, I only write with people that I think are better writers than me because I can learn from them. And I only want to work with editors that are better at editing. Like I can edit, but not like Silas. And so uh. surround <laughs> like, just like, I, yeah. like, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the most recent video that you guys had released, it's it's Michelle running in the hottest place on earth. There's a two specific cuts that I think are truly special in that video. And I wanna hear you guys' breakdown of it. So this is the moment when I finished the technical marathon, which is 26.2 miles. The first interesting thing about this is that you would expect the music to be incredibly inspirational and climactic and huge and swell, but it's the complete opposite. You did it! You did it! You, you did took it. all of that out, and it is just ambient droning, and like it sounds almost sad. It, it is a little bit sad. Yeah, it's it's definitely bittersweet. Like she's glad that she crossed, but also something's not, not right. Yeah, like she's not fulfilled yet. And so that was just us using. I mean, when you're a filmmaker, you aren't just using your shots to tell the story. You're also using sound design, color, sound effects. Everything needs to cohesively work to tell a story. We used color correction to make it feel warmer, sound to feel hotter. We used, in this moment, music to assist on making you feel unfulfilled with Michelle's accomplishment. Like even just hearing a couple of claps, it just doesn't feel- like Typically uh, when someone finishes a marathon, you hear like a huge crowd, right? Yeah. But just keeping it to, you got yeah. this, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. just emphasizes not only the un 
satisfying nature of it, but also the aloneness. Huge uh, subversion of expectations here. You're expecting something big and it's something empty and sad. And you're expecting me to be celebrating mm -hmm. also. So Michelle's now sitting in the RV, being sort of pep-talked by her coaches, talking about sort of the internal struggle that and why this doesn't feel as powerful as she was like, thinking that it was going to feel. Why doesn't this huge success feel like a victory? I just feel like the pandemic like stole so much. Yeah. My 20s and I just want to take it back here. And so the first cut here I think we're going to talk about, which is w one of my personal favorite moments, is while sort of reiterating your why, we flash back, not even audio-wise, just visually to a scene that happened in the two-minute mark of the entire episode. One more time. Say it louder. Louder. I'm a badass. Yeah. Louder for the people in the back. I'm a badass. Which is you meeting her for the first time and you guys discussing your why together. Uh, which was your character arc of this episode, which is age. I'm turning 30 in four weeks, and I'm actually terrified. Because the channel is about you being athletic and you doing these crazy challenges, and that's your identity. And if you don't have that, then why are people caring up to watch you? And so while you cross the finish line, you're still not satisfied, and we sort of visually cut back in the moment when she's t telling you, you're a badass. And reminding us of everything that's happened, mm -hmm. the journey we've been on. There's nothing more powerful than a reminder of where you started. This one specifically was something that I saw and I I just was sitting talking and brainstorming this video with Michelle, the finale, and I just, it, like literally the cut happened in my head and I'm like, oh my God, we gotta use this footage in this way. And at that time, we didn't even use some of the scene in Wyoming. We didn't even have that in the edit originally, not all oh, of it. Oh wow, really? We went back and added it back in to better tell and set up this character arc. I mean, in the Snyder's beats, like Save the Cat story structure, theme stated is like one of the first beats that happens. Absolutely. It's the, the protagonist is being told literally the theme and the character arc that they're about to go through, but because they don't have the wisdom yet, it goes right through their, you know, go right in one ear, out the other. They don't understand it. And so they have to now learn it the hard way. Mm -hmm. Michelle's now learned it the hard way. And now we cut back to the moment of the theme stated, but now she does have the wisdom to understand it and now push through that. So the last cut here that we'll briefly touch on, it's this moment in the finale where Michelle's finally hitting the 30 mile mark, which is the ultra marathon. So this is not what was promised. This was going literally the extra mile. And the shot that we're sort of talking about is the moment the music builds up and swells and it's this drone tilt down on the entire team running with Michelle. This moment is interesting for me because this was some a shot and a moment that we planned before we even shot the video. We knew that there was a potential that Michelle might want to push herself and go an extra few miles to hit that ultra marathon. We didn't know if it was going to happen, but if it did happen in pre-pro, and we talked about this with Kevin, our, our DP, is that there's this one moment I really want to capture, and it's the moment that everyone joins in to help her at the end. Now, Michelle didn't actually know that that was going I to occur. It was a surprise. So we were that. able to keep that as a surprise, and we got those reactions from her. You told me about the, the tilt down in advance, and so I always knew that that, so when I was building that scene, I already had that at that moment, just as a placeholder. But then the choice to have the quiet mo music moment and the slow-mo before that was definitely a conscious choice. Go team! Let's go. You, got it. you have the music build and you have the intensity of her running build prior to that moment. And then it's kind of just like a bass drop or, you know, a rise and cut to black in a trailer. You build it up and then drop it out for a second and then come back in on the the new exciting classic. thing. So, classic. 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 Yeah. Classic. Yeah. The, the, like the dropout, basically the quiet moment, that was more my idea. And then uh, I, I knew about your tilt down concept to begin with. So that was always going to be there. Hello, cheeky segue. In traditional media, the crew gets residuals for the work that they produce. And for a long time, YouTube didn't have that option. Until now. Stir lets creators split their AdSense with their team. If you're an editor, producer, writer, or thumbnail artist, Stir can allow you to take your cut of the project's AdSense automatically. That means you don't have to do the maths, it does it for you. Which is bloody great because I'm really crap at maths. Stir's credit feature also lets crew members get credited for their work. Simply paste the video into Stir, 
request a credit, and once approved, it appears on your profile. This is Web Media's version of IMDb, so don't miss out on this opportunity to get credit for your work. I think it's really interesting that you built out the sequence not in chronological order. And I think that's one thing that editors think they have to do all the time. They're like, okay, I have to do this shot and then the next shot and then the next shot. But you could really start from any place in the sequence and start slowly putting the puzzle together. So I think that's really cool. We, we do that a lot in montages too, especially if the music already is in place. I think, okay, well, this is a moment or moments that I would really want to be on this beat or another beat and then just keep those there. So then I can try to figure out how to either build up or come down from them. I just really want to talk about sound and just music in general really quick, because I think that's one of the things that sets apart a good editor from a great editor. Sometimes you have a scene that's based in reality and sometimes you put music in to support it. But other times you have a score that's already pre-planned in your mind. You're like, okay, we're gonna have a big moment of music here. We're gonna have a slow moment right here. And you know, okay, like, okay, this visual needs to go with this emotional beat because the score that you're that you're saying is literally emotional beats mm -hmm. that, that come one after another. And that is what informs the audience of how to feel in a certain particular moment. So you can control that with the slider. Oh, okay, what are we gonna play? Are we gonna play music? Are we not gonna play music? What kind of music? And being very emotionally intelligent by not choosing over the top music or by choosing music that plays up to the audience's emotional intelligence is so, so important. We do spend a lot of time on the music and that's actually, I think, with the videos within the last year, we've actually been spending a lot more time on music and being pickier about the music, especially Garrett, which is totally fine because what you see in the final product, I think that I get probably 75% of it right, but sometimes I do go too over the top, like you were saying, or it's not enough, or the cheer video is actually a great example of where my normal approach, which I did do at first, mm -hmm. And we weren't working in person together. So my normal approach was have music for mostly everything. And we actually ended up just taking probably 75% of the music out. Good. All right, pull stretch. You got this. You ready? One, two. Oh, she learned a pull now? Okay. Let's go, UK. Playing the scenes of the cheer video dry yeah, was much really better, much, much better. better. And I don't, I, that I don't even know the answer. I mean, you really. Well, it was also like kind of the first of that kind of video where it was much more raw documentary. So it was more fitting for there to be a lot less music in that. But it is something we spend a lot of time on. And also something that we always spend time on is just making sure that most of the video, except for sometimes montages or big tentpole scenes, we almost always edit everything without music first. That's a very important discipline to have because it's quite often that we find a good track, we put it underneath and then we let yeah. that influence how we cut. If you need to ensure that those story is told simply by the cuts, maybe even without even sound designers, like, is that story very, very clear? Great. And now you then begin to support it. There are a lot of times, whether it's the mix or something else, a lot of times the the songs that we do download, there are just aspects of them that I don't like or like a lot of times the percussion elements that the composer is using are just not coming through. Maybe it's a scene with lots of other sounds or noisy elements. And so I have lots of instruments that I will layer on top of that. And we incorporate rises and all kinds of other things that like, I mean, sometimes I've even cut multiple songs together as if they were one song. So th there is a lot of time spent on the music and we, we try to make it even sound better than it came from the website if possible. I wanna just put an emphasis on this. This is like, I think what separates Silas's music editing from other things I've seen on YouTube is what he just said is this massive library of sounds, of bass hits, of cymbal crashes, swells, and it's a very common thing in trailer editing uh, so to take those and layer them on and really punch up different moments of songs. Um, but I think that's a really easy way to like level up if you're on YouTube trying to make your music sound a little better for your footage is doing that process. It comes back to the uh, the idea of, I think it's one of the first things that we're all taught in film school where you can get away with bad visuals, but you can't get away with bad sound. And in this case, we listen to films so much more than we actually watch them. And so that is a very underutilized and underrated uh, tool for you to use as an editor. You're really ensuring that I can essentially close my eyes and still understand the story because of your sound design. And that's what carries literally all the emotion. Like 
yeah. all like 90, 80 to 90 percent of the emotion is in the sound. That's why if you're watching a horror movie, you turn off the sound, you're not scared. I think there's a lot of content creators who are trying to like figure out how can I make my content more real after as we're like coming out of this um Spectacle, chase. spectacle renaissance mm -hmm. uh, and moving into a new renaissance, which I'm very excited about. And I think something in addition to what Silas was saying about like, sometimes we just take the music out of the scenes. A great example of this is Tom Scott, mm -hmm. who doesn't have any music in his videos, which is a fascinating choice, but it feels more real. Mm -hmm. And he talks about feeling real in the videos. And to me, it's not just whether there's music or whether there's not, but it's these little moments when people don't even realize they're being filmed. And that moment that we cut back to wasn't us talking or like having a specific situation. It was a moment of truthful human existence. And I think like those are often cut out of a retention focused edit. Do you guys focus on retention? Or what, like what, like where are you on the retention spectrum? Or like stories king, we literally don't care. Or retention, that's the only thing that matters. Retention has been the worst thing to come through our edit suite. Like, <laughs> just, just thinking about it uh, constantly. Yeah. Not the worst thing. Like it has driven us to improve some things that were in it need has. of It has. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at our episodes from one, two years ago, they're more like classic TV editing and yeah. they're expecting the viewer, when you click on the video, you're gonna watch the whole thing. And as we've seen people talk about retention, we, we swung the complete opposite direction. We're like, okay, retention, retention, retention. And our comments were all, we missed the old style of storytelling, wow. but we're also trying to be intelligent about like, how can we be up with the trends? And I think that this cut actually does a great example of that because it's a moment that's very, retention focused actually. It's a moment you're you're completely zeroed in because you're like, what is going on here? And visually it takes you somewhere else, but from a retention perspective, there's still a ton going on. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like what we've tried to do is just challenge ourselves to be better storytellers. We have some videos that like, we didn't have the footage needed to tell a great story. Our hands were tied for other various reasons, whether it's brands or whatnot. And we relied on retention editing. And yeah, our audience doesn't want it. And that's another good thing to remember is like, we can edit for retention, uh, but we've built an audience that is willing to sit there for 30 minutes. And we found the longer, more drawn out episodes for yeah. our specific audience that f subscribes to your channel, they are willing to sit down like it's a Netflix show. Cause they know when they see that thumbnail and title and it's a Michelle video, they click it and they're ready to sit there and watch for 25 minutes. Which is a privilege. Yeah, with most creators, they posted a video. I will watch it on my phone, knowing that's the habit that their content has taught me. This, it's okay to watch on your phone. Whereas I would click on one of you guys' videos five seconds in and went, no, the phone's not gonna do it justice. <laughs> oh my God. And so, <laughs> and, and, but like, and so I will stop watching it, go on my couch and then watch it on the television, knowing that's how I want to watch it. We had a huge discovery when we looked in what platforms or devices people were watching our content on. We have a huge spike in television viewership, which is very uncommon for you. Cause you're telling the audiences, don't watch us on your phone, watch us on the television. I think that we, we view retention as a very digital focused strategy. Mm -hmm. When in fact, television kind of already had a prehistoric version of this, where in before every commercial break, you have to give some sort of mm. breadcrumb of drama to come for the future and then cut to commercial. Yeah, every commercial break is a retention hook. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. cliffhanger, literally. Instead of doing that, you know, what, three times an episode, we have to do it more often and more elegantly. To me, we started doing it and then not like I watched 10 minutes of retention at hyper focusing on retention. I'd watch that 10 minutes and I'm like, I got nothing out of that. I saw a bunch of images flash and I didn't learn anything. I didn't feel anything. I didn't remember anything. And that was an issue. Now that was just us being bad at optimizing retention. I think we're still learning that. Um, but that was my my first experience, like hyper focusing on that. We also have made a lot of changes to the openings of the videos and what people are hearing and seeing in the first few seconds. And so the 911 video is a great example of where a lot more clearly the story is being told right away. I have no idea what's coming. Nope, no idea So it could be cat in a tree. Absolutely. It could be- Just like a day in my life, you're gonna be living it, you're gonna be doing it. Whereas a lot of the videos before Either we did have sort of the trailer cold open beforehand, and that was cool. 
but sometimes it was still too ambiguous as to what people were going to see. So there wasn't a good reason to keep watching through that cool opening. I also think this goes back to your point uh, on expectations and the medium. So when you're watching a television show on Netflix, the cold open, you know, that's footage that we're going to see later in the story where when you're on YouTube, because the medium is like, oh, that could be archival footage, found footage that could be from another creator. That could be the footage you've captured. The footage we're watching in the cold open could be anything because we don't know the expectation from a YouTube video because anyone can make a, a some upload something to YouTube. We don't know what we're looking at and we have no reason to trust that we're going to that this is going to pay off in 20 minutes. That's what it is. It's trust and the message of trust that you can show at the beginning of the video. I mean, that's something where a lot of creators have definitely learned, whereas I think TV and film has the privilege of trust that they've built up straight away, whereas with a creator, you have to ask for their trust to stay every single time you click on a video. Yeah, or even like the second episode of a television show. You don't need to convince them to watch it they're in because yeah, that's in right yeah. but we got to do that on every single video that we do i think a content creator that is doing it like really really well in terms of storytelling is nico omelana he in my opinion is is the best storyteller on youtube right now in in the way that he uses every aspect of editing the graphics the storytelling everything i mean he made uh getting dressed up in a prime bottle to go in a ring, <laughs> what, it's like a 30 minute video or something? Yeah, I can't an remember. invigorating experience. It, incredibly, yes, it and it really challenged me. I was like, man, we're doing crazy things. And of course, by nature, it's an amazing story. And obviously what he did was really <laughs> amazing and impressive as well. It's a simple story that he crafted into this magnum opus. And I think we can all be challenged to to just be better storytellers and, and use the resources available to us. I mean, you can see he did, he uploads like once every three months. I think with Nico, it comes back to the trust thing. If, if you can build a habit of trust with your audiences, you post a video once every three months, it's an event. Everyone, shut the fuck up. Nico's posted a video, let's sit down and watch it right now. That's when you truly do get the absolute, I would say probably perfect retention, knowing that you've created that trust for your audiences. You kind of got the spectacle uh, idea, like, hey, yeah, we, uh, hey, we, we competed in this tournament, it was great, it was fun, and then became the personal story. And I think that's one of the things that is very special with the content that you make, where it's like, yeah, here's the spectacle idea, but then it's actually about me and how I'm, as a personality, as a character, is going to change for the better. It is a common misconception that with reality TV that it's you just turn up on set and hope for the best. Right, right. Uh, well, I think in, in most cases is you do come up with concepts of story of where this could potentially go. And then that gives you the primer to start thinking of that story and then see if you can find the organic and natural opportunities to follow through with that most likely story. And I think that's a privilege that we have on digital versus traditional, why a lot of the reality shows you watch now in the year 2022 often feel ultra fabricated because they're on such a strict deadline. You have to do so many episodes. Every episode has to have an A and a B and a whatever. Mm -hmm. And with ours, we have a little bit more ability to let the story guide us where it takes us. And I appreciate that because I think it allows us to bring in the structure of a story producer on a reality show with the flexibility of digital. You said story producer. That's a role I don't think many people have particularly heard of. How can you describe a story producer? So a story producer on a like a typical reality or competition show is someone who is keeping tabs on every single contestant or participant and is crafting, okay, this person had this drama with this person. And so maybe we could use that in the edit. They're, they're watching it happen as it happens. And in the confessionals, which you guys can, you know, in any reality show, when they cut to like a talking head, the person who's on the other side of the camera asking the questions is the story producer. So sometimes they're asking questions to to elaborate further on a specific piece of drama or a point of conflict or even a, a point of peace between two characters to really craft it as it's happening. So Garrett kind of and I sort of way, share yeah, that like role. The story but, producer in Survivor knows all the gossip that's going on behind yeah. the scenes mm -hmm. and then in the interviews make sure that they, they're asking questions to yeah. prod it out of them and get it out of them to make sure they have the story necessary to tell the story of the episode. And it's also a role that like we have seen firsthand, all of us, Gar um, um, Silas was on Dance Moms. Um, well, uh, as a production Yeah, assistant, but you, yeah. You, you, you witnessed it happen. <laughs> but yeah, you, you see how 
how the story producer guides everything. And if they're not getting the, the plot points basically they need, then yeah, they got to send the producers in and make the drama happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't do that necessarily, but well, yeah. I think we're fortunate. We don't have to do that. Yeah. A lot I of mean, the I'm worlds dramatic that we're enough, diving in. So. Yeah. Like we don't have to fabricate cause there's so much, I mean, you've seen some of the videos are nuts. Like the things that are just happening organically. I mean, I think we have the, the freedom of we're not making, 20 episodes so we don't need to make drama for 20 we only need drama for we'd one love episode, to so. make 20 <laughs> episodes and then i also witnessed the story producer role when i was on karma on hbo max hosting for them so it, that was a very traditional set a challenge reality show with a bunch of kids in the wilderness competing for a lump sum of money and so i actually got to work with a lot of the story producers from survivor from amazing race from a lot of those huge shows where they really have to craft a story out of whatever the heck happens. In our own interviews, when we have talking head interviews, it's often me or Garrett, who's the person for the eyeline. So we often take those skills we've learned from those traditional sets and bring them into play. With the creators that are starting to understand story, what lessons would you love for them to learn soon? Oh, I got one. Okay. Hey, it's something we actually talk about all the time, uh, casting. Casting. If you're going to like if and I think this is something that Eric learned and started to nail, which is he, if he's going to recreate some of the most famous tentpole reality shows. Genius idea right now. YouTube is just 20 years behind right now. Now having the reality TV phase, it's starting to become really popular. Eric's doing a great job at that. And he's taking each of these reality concepts, but he's doing really great casting with some of the characters. He has these through line characters that we do want to watch throughout multiple episodes. He's building his own little cinematic universe in a way. And I think that's really, really powerful and something that um, not everyone is utilizing right now that they, they really should be. Casting is a really big thing, part of what we do. I mean, whenever I'm going to do a video like training like an Olympic boxer for 100 days, we interview and email so many coaches of all different skills, all different backgrounds. Because sometimes you find someone with an amazing resume and then on camera, they're not very compelling or interesting or funny. And sometimes you find the exact opposite, like someone who has a little less experience is fantastic on camera. Or they just have the right story to tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we always try to find someone, um, again, who's not just gonna be good on camera and has the expertise, but also like you just said, Garrett, has a good story we can tell so that we can also not rely just on me to guide the viewer through the emotional journey, but also in the marathon video, for example, we have Chantel, we have the other runners who are with me, other people we can lean on. And I feel like so far on YouTube, it's only been used in a comedic capacity. Like, oh, here's like my, you know, my Guillermo to my Jimmy on uh, on set, like just, just as, a, just as a punchline every now and then. And I, I feel that some of these larger content creators could be utilizing, if you're gonna be giving away so much money or an amazing experience, tell an amazing story at the same time. Like let's let's see the journey that that person goes on and the impact that that has on their lives. Something that I have definitely struggled with at times and had to learn over the last several years and even before that was not not getting too connected to what I'm editing. And so that's a really important lesson for any editor that is struggling with that. It's okay. And it's okay to have a lot of stuff cut. It's okay to invite a lot of people in to look at what you're doing and be really critical. And I think you actually touched on that in one of the other episodes that you guys recorded. I can't remember now, but uh, that's, that's really important. And being able to, you won't be able to get better if you don't get that criticism, if you don't explore different techniques and some of them will fail and you have to do that to, to get better. I think everything that any YouTuber is trying to do has already been done in the last hundred years of filmmaking. Including us. It's so like we wanted <laughs> yeah. the 911 video. Okay, well, a bunch of videos exist that you can draw inspiration from, that you can learn from. You don't need to make mistakes for the first time. Those films already exist. They've already proven themselves. Just watch more content, uh, watch more movies. I completely agree with what Garrett said. But uh, yeah, to expand on that, you can you can borrow from any form of entertainment and it could be it could be stealing techniques from huge movies. I, I, we actually were joking a little bit about how the badass flashback in that moment of marathon, it almost, it felt like sort of a Nolan flashback almost. He does that a lot toward just like, you know, 
people not saying or doing anything, but just sitting in a moment. And so we did that there. I genuinely believe right now is the best time to be a creator. I think this era is, it's like the 90s independent film era. It's like, I'm, here's me comparing YouTube to the French New Wave, but I'm going to compare it to the French New Wave. Like, um, because the barrier right now is so low to create uh, and like you can just pick up a phone and you can upload straight to a platform where you have audience members now who can just see you and be it, it can be fed to them. But, you know, like in the 90s or in the French New Wave, when cameras became more accessible or cheaper and you can now move around out of a studio um, like it, it literally reminds me of like Breathless and Godard invented the jump cut just because he was trying to shorten the runtime, almost retention editing. Like he had to get his film shorter and invented an entire new tool of storytelling by accident. And I think that's what we're, you know, what we were seeing with like Emma Chamberlain and Casey Neistat and what we're continuing to see now with Ryan and Eric and Jimmy and all these other huge creators is this new um, reinvention of storytelling and an evolution of storytelling. And it's just really exciting to be a part of that. So is there anything else you guys would like to tell editors all over the world? Watching right now? <laughs> <laughs> the floor We're is yours. Worldwide. We're hiring. 